Smartcast. TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. There's a change happening in the way we live, the way we work, the way we spend our money and make our decisions. We are evolving to be more conscious in our actions in a way that serves the world and makes it a better place. Welcome to The Ethical Evolution. The Ethical Evolution podcast is brought to you by Ethical Change Agency. I'm Bindi, I'm the founder, and my mission is to help ethical entrepreneurs and holistic healers to find their voice through spiritual coaching and podcasting. I'm honoured to bring you the stories of those who create change through healing, kindness, innovation, purpose, and spirit. Understanding that to create collective change, we need to be the change. It all begins with us. John Ladder is a mystic author, teacher, and former founder and CEO of a multi-million dollar consumer products company. He shares intimate and personal stories and teaches workshops on leadership, healing, transformation, awakening, love, synchronicity, and wisdom that unite and expand human experience. In our conversation, John shared the experience of his kundalini awakening and how his dreams became his guide. I hope you are as fascinated by this story as I was. Welcome, John, to The Ethical Evolution. Thank you so much, Bendy. Really glad to be here. Now, for those who don't know who you are, can you tell us who you are and what you do? Yeah, I'm an author, a teacher, and a mystic, and um, I wrote a book recently called The Synchronicity of Love, Stories That Heal, Transform, and Awaken. Amazing. Now, I know there's probably people listening who've listened to many of the episodes on this show, um, but there's probably people who are curious, what is a mystic? Well, my definition of a mystic is somebody who gets information from God knows where. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, it, another way to look at it might be intuition. Um, I would say most of my information comes through dreams. And so I pay very close attention to my dreams. Mm, that's interesting. Um, you know, in the uh, probably the last five years, um, I've also uh, become, I guess, if you want to call it one of those two. Um, and <laughs> Yeah, and I'm always curious to see how people receive those messages and how they tune into them and then what, how they harness them and what they do with them. Uh, when did you know that, you know, there was something bigger, that you were getting these messages that were for a purpose? Well, I'd say about 20 years ago, I went to my first ever spiritual retreat and the teacher there uh, put a lot of emphasis on dreams. So I said, well, geez, I don't have dreams. I had an occasional nightmare when I was a kid, I guess, but I don't remember anything. And he gave us an exercise and he said, when you go to sleep at night, put a little journal or some recording device next to your bed. And as you're starting to fall asleep, imagine yourself naked standing on the edge of a cliff with your back to the abyss and let yourself fall backwards into the abyss and ask for a dream. Mm. So I started doing that night after night after night. And I started to have a dream. I remember a dream. Now, at the beginning, I had no freaking idea what they <laughs> meant. That's a whole world in itself, the language of dreams. But I loved it. I mean, God, it's such a source of unbelievable inspiration and creativity. You just don't know what's going to come through. And, um, and so that was the beginning of the door opening for me. And I think like a lot of people, my dreams were, I'm going to just loosely call them psychological in nature to begin with. But over time, they became more clear and definitive, helpful. They felt like guidance. And uh, and the teacher I worked with said, that's that's pretty normal. You know, mm. people kind of have to work through their stuff, you might say. Um, there's a great author, uh, Judith Orloff, wrote a book called Second Sight. And she talked about that. She just loosely defines dreams as psychological or psychic. The psychic ones being, hey, look, pay attention. Mm. This is important. Mm. This is for you. 
this just is in your mind just processing some stuff. Yeah, and I guess, you know, for me, the the dream realm probably hasn't been where my messages have come. Um, it first started, I would just get words in my head yeah. and I'd be like, and then I started to realise that geographically they would happen in the same place all the time, which was right next to a cemetery. And I was like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> and then it started to broaden. The more I opened up to it, it just, you know, my intuition was rock solid, you know, like I would get the guidance and the messages that were spot on 100% and, you know, people would come to me and say, can you tell me what's in the crystal ball, you know? It's like I had this yeah. crystal ball and and it was bang on, 100% right every time. And they were like, this is freaky. And, and you know, I've spoken to many psychics um, who have said I'm also psychic and I just, I was just like, no, it's just tapping into that that side of ourselves and listening and then understanding that it actually means something. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. I love that. Thank you for sharing that story. <laughs> you know, I've had some wonderful teachers say uh, uh, people get their messages differently. And mm. so I think in your case, they would probably call it clear cognizant, where you just know. You don't know how you know, you just yeah. know. Like, yeah. It's just boom, answers right there. Um, I get that too, but I tend to be more visual. I think I have to shut my brain off and go to sleep and have it be painted for me. Mm. Some people, it's very auditory. It's not just a knowing, like there literally is a voice something beyond just the usual chatter of the mind that's and that voice in my experience can be very subtle and very quick but it's there and um i know you know um einstein used to say uh intuition is the gift and logic is its faithful servant mm. we've elevated the servant and forgotten the gift and uh i think that's that's an important thing is teaching people to to try to access their own intuition and to trust it mm. And it takes a lot of practice too. Um, yeah. But once you, I don't know, it's this fine tuning and over time, it's, it's like any muscle, I guess, you know, you exercise it and it just gets stronger. So, yeah, I, I just, I love it because just asking and knowing and understanding um, it just really helps in all your decision making and, and even guiding others, I think, um, you know, and in business as well, you probably could relate to this having been a CEO as well, how do yeah. you, how would you integrate that spiritual side of things into business? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think it began with just what you're talking about, listening to that quiet voice inside me. Uh, more often than not, that voice would tell me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> just listen. Um, and sometimes my mind would override that voice. I think I um, became more compassionate, more of a compassionate CEO over time. I'm more likely to throw my arms around somebody and say, come on, let's go for a walk. We got to talk about some stuff. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I, I want to say I became kinder, but I, that's probably a, not a good description. Um, yeah. I think I became uh more honest with my employees. I think I became more vulnerable with my employees. I think the communication with them went deeper than it did before. There's kind of a fine line in business, you know, how deep, how vulnerable do you want to go with people you work with? Um, and so, and, and interestingly, um, I would sometimes share dreams. My employees would share dreams with me, which was kind of cool. You mm. know? And um, <clears throat> so, uh, to answer your question, I had to try and figure it out every single day. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I uh, one of the things that, because I also work full-time in government, um, and one of the things that I see, my philosophy is, you know, it as a leader, it's really about the people. It's not about the task because without one you don't have the other. And, yeah. and really if you can develop that connection with people, you build that trust and that yeah. rapport that you can make decisions together and work together more collab collaboratively. Um, and I've found, like, it's not, like, sometimes it's not even conscious. It just happens, you know. And people know that you bring that energy with you and to expect that from you all the time and to meet you in the middle. So for yeah. me, it's really about the connection with people. And, and from that comes the kindness, the caring, you know, all of the things that a leader should be. Um, to help someone be the whole human that they are. 
I think you totally nailed it. And it makes work, work richer if that's mm. the environment. I think it's sometimes harder to pull off if you're CEO of 10,000 people or, you know, president or prime minister of a nation. It's a little harder to pull off, but uh, it definitely it, it enriches the work environment. I, um, I had uh, one employee that would share her dreams with me periodically, and, and they were beautiful dreams. I had a dream completely out of left field. Uh, a precognitive dream. It, it lasted for like two seconds where I just saw her daughter. And, and in the dream, somehow I knew she was engaged to this big dude from Texas. <laughs> and, uh, and, she, and I told her about it kind of cautiously. She goes, no, nah, my daughter's not dating. She's certainly not going out with some big guy from Texas. So I wrote it <laughs> off and said, well, it's just a dream. Well, about a month later, she goes, John, come over here. And she shows me a picture of her daughter and she's dating this guy who's a foot taller than her, this great big guy from Texas. <laughs> Two years later, they got married. Wow. And so that's the other part of those sort of richer connections. I think you're connecting at a level way beyond the surface and it's a really beautiful thing. Mm, yeah. And just that energy, it just speaks volumes, doesn't it? And like, I, you know, in the in the world that we work now, where a lot of things are done via Zoom or remote, you know, um, people think it can be hard to connect with people through those mediums. But I don't think so. Like, if you're someone who's truly connected and can read people, um, I can tell the minute someone gets on a call and the, their energy is off, I can tell straight away. Um, and I'm like, <laughs> I'll say to someone like, um, are you feeling that too? You know, like, <laughs> so <laughs> I think, you know, having that ability to read people regardless of where they are geographically, like I'm doing it right now with you, John. Oh, how do I look? Oh, you're doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's funny, I, I took a class, uh, online from a psychic because he said, we're all intuitive, but like you said, it just takes a little practice. And one of the things he asked us to do was, um, we practice on each other, doing readings on each other. And he says, the first thing I want you to do is just check in with your own intuition and ask, is that person that I'm about to read open? Mm. Because if they're not, they're going to be hard to read. Mm. And so that's the first thing I want you to check in with, are they open? And sometimes I think that's the greatest gift of all, because if there's this subtle openness between you and the other person, a lot of things can be spoken about and shared. But if your intuition says, nope, for whatever reason, they're shut down, don't want to talk, their heart's closed, then just give them a hug, talk about the weather. <laughs> there's no point in pushing it. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> I yeah, so I... I noticed that, you know, in the way that I read people and then I try to explain it to other people, they're like, I don't know what you're going on about. They're fine. You know, like from a from an employee kind of standpoint, you're kind of like, nah, something's off. And other people yeah. who don't understand it, it's really hard to explain to them that you just know in your gut something's not yeah. right, you know? Yeah. <laughs> now, John, tell us about your book. Um, well, the title, The Synchronicity of Love. So my path after going through all sorts of hell, which I think almost everybody <laughs> has some sort of death and rebirth after going through a lot of pain, um, was a path of what I would call the heart center or unconditional love. And what I noticed as I started to follow that path was, uh, I don't think I even knew what the word meant, but I used to just call it, wow, that was an amazing coincidence. So I have a very logical, linear, rational, masculine mind. And every time I'd like, wow, what are the chances of that happening? But it kept happening again and again and again. And there was this sense of like the red carpet being rolled out in front of me. And I just had to choose to walk on it. And um, so, and, and little things and big things that I think I probably would have called miracles or miraculous, or like I said, coincidences, all these synchronicities happened. The more I tried to stay in that lane of what feels like unconditional love. And so um, I wrote 119 short stories, most of which are true stories, a lot of them connected to dreams, and, um, and shared the last 20 years of my life and where that's taken me. Uh, there's a lot of really spiritual, amazing experiences in there. And I tried to also write it as a dad who got divorced, and almost went bankrupt and had custody of two kids 
there were 9-11 and it was a really difficult time. So I tried to include some of the quote unquote real world stories in there too. Mm-hmm. And um, had uh, talk about something that just came out of left field, a whole long uh, period, multi-year period of Kundalini energy, which I didn't even know what the word meant. Mm-hmm. Uh, and boy, that was quite a ride. And then shared in there, the difficulty with that was when it, the energetic started to fade and the big experiences started to fade and almost, it's almost like an alcoholic coming down from the high. Mm. And so, um, and I wrote it in such a way, cause I, I wouldn't say I have a short attention span, but I maybe have an impatient attention span. <laughs> so I wrote it the way I liked other authors that would write short stories, actual experiences. Cause I learn a lot from other people's actual experiences and while the book is loosely chronological, I also wanted the kind of book you can just randomly open to. You went to bed at night and just read one or two stories because most of the stories are one to three pages long. Amazing. And um, I, I did do a little bit of research on you before uh, we connected. And okay. um, um, you you also had this this fear of death. Yeah. Tell us about that. Oh, my God. That's so funny. So I think I'm roughly 39 years old. I've made not a lot of money, but enough money that I had this goal when I was in high school that I could retire when I turned 40. Mm. And I wasn't quite rich enough to retire at 40, but I definitely could have quit my job and taken a few years off. And so right when everything in some ways was going really well, out of the blue, I had this unbelievable fear of death. And I had pushed uh, religion and spirituality as far away from me as possible for my entire adult life. Um, just thought it was make believe mumbo jumbo wasn't interested in it. And, um, and I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't even know who to talk to about it. I didn't go to church. I, <laughs> who do you talk to about this unbelievable fear of what felt like oblivion? And I just couldn't get out of my head. I'd be hiding behind closed doors in tears. Like, Oh my God, this is terrible. And um <clears throat> And then as so often happens, everything in my life went wrong at the same time. So I had to push my fear of death to the background a little bit. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a really difficult time being a single dad and my company was suffering and I was so in debt. It was ridiculous. I, at one point I was $650,000 in personal debt and I didn't see any way I was ever going to get out of it. Um, but then well, fast forward two or three years I joined a year-round spiritual study group, and I remember it was like it was yesterday. The teacher said for the month of November, you know, which for us, we're starting to get into winter here, we're going to explore the mystery of death. And he goes, I want you to prepare for your own death. If you don't have a will, make it. If you have to make amends to somebody, make amends. You know, whatever you have to do, pretend you're going to die at the end of this month. And then if you're afraid of death, I want you to read books on death, um, meditate on death, listen to music about death. And I think that was the first time in my life I really understood the value of turning around and facing your fears and embracing them. That was the greatest thing I ever did. And it was astounding, the dreams that came through. And by the time it was done, I had no fear of death. And I still don't today. I just, if anything, I welcome it. And so... I may have other little fears that I trip up over, but death is not one of them. And uh, and I I threw myself into it with abandon. Mm-hmm. I didn't just dabble in it. I like I am sick of running scared from this. I need to know what is going on. Where am I going? Who am I? And it was all resolved in that month of November. That's incredible. Yeah, like I've I've spoken to several people about death and and obviously spirituality, but. Um, one thing that was coming through for me there when you were speaking was, you know, it's almost like people have this fear of spirituality because it's the unknown, um, yeah. it's woo-woo, you know, it's all of this stuff. Um, yeah, And you said that you pushed away religion and spirituality for most of your life mm-hmm. and it was the thing that, you know, turned you around. I mean, yeah. wh- where does the fear lie? Is it the unknown? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You know, for me, the beginning was something really silly. Uh, So I was raised Catholic, but kind of like part-time Catholic. Like we'd go for six months and then we'd go a year with maybe only going on Christmas. But one day when I'm probably around 13 years of age, I'm going to church and 
In the Catholic tradition, a woman had to cover her head when she entered church. Uh, otherwise, it was considered a sin. And this day, my mother didn't cover her head, and I pointed it out. And she said, oh, the, the church elders decided it's not a sin anymore. And I was flabbergasted. I had this idea, like, well, the Bible was written by God. What? It's, it's written by men, and the rules can be changed. And, and so something shifted in me, and I just was just antagonistic towards it all. I just went, ah, it's got to be all make-believe. Um, and... And I think at that stage of my life, you know, early adulthood, I was sort of um, in that sort of rigid, rational mindset and very happy with it, competitive, rigid, rational. And I just had, I don't know if I was afraid of it. I just didn't think it was real. Mm. And um, In fact, I, I sometimes joke that my book could be called uh, rigid rational male transforms into random <laughs> accidental mystics. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I think for a lot of people, I, if you were to ask me to just speculate, it is that fear of the unknown. It's gosh, I remember speaking to a therapist who said, John, I can, I can take this person who's my client and point to them and say, yes, the grass really is greener over there. All you have to do is cross the bridge. Your life will be so much better, but they won't because the familiarity, even mm. though it's painful, is better than the unknown. Mm. And so there's a certain amount of safety in the known, even though it might suck. Mm. Yeah. And another thing that comes to mind, you know, in, in a lot of therapy now, um, particularly in psychology and, you know, when we talk about happiness and all of those kind of things, when we look at the parts that make us a whole human, spirituality is one of those parts and it's mm -hmm. part of our healing and part of our happiness. Um, yeah. So it is becoming more popular in, you know, traditional therapy and, you know, in, in growth. Um, so it's also starting to creep into the business world a lot more um, because, I, I'm getting bombarded with people who want to talk about it. So oh, I, it. I just, uh, you know, we're finally reaching that, that point where people are waking up, Yeah, which leads us to the Kundalini thing that you were talking about. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I dabbled in this a few years ago um, and I was absolutely fascinated by it. Can you tell us about, like, I know Kundalini awakenings are pretty full on <laughs> for some people. Um, what was your experience? <laughs> I love to tell you about that. Uh, so true story. So uh, I owned a, a corporation, did millions of dollars worth of business. I was the founder and CEO, and I was on a business trip, and I had my chance to appear on QVC, the home shopping network, which was a big deal. And they told me um, that I would have 700,000 new viewers per minute. And so I was a little nervous, you know, so I got on the air, had my seven minutes of fame. I didn't screw up. I sold a moderate amount of product, not a lot, but a moderate amount. And I go back to my hotel room in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I can't seem to go to sleep at night. I'm, I'm, my body's full of joy and I can't figure it out. All I can figure is I must be really excited that I didn't screw up on live national TV. <laughs> and, uh, and there was a lot of relief around that. And and it was a three hour time difference from Seattle. Anyway, around midnight, I'm laying in bed, not asleep, just sort of half awake. And all of a sudden I feel what feels like an orgasm in my perineum area. And it's beautiful. And it happens like in slow motion. And I feel this energy run up my spine, but I also feel the pleasure just permeate my whole body. I'm like, what the hell was that? <laughs> and, uh, and then, I don't know, five minutes later, poof. It happens again and again and again. And I'm laying there in this state of the Catholic boy in me is going, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and the other part of me is like, I don't know, but I am not giving this up. This feels so good. I can't even tell you. And um, so it went on for hours. And I finally stood up and tried to shake off the energy. It felt like I drank a bunch of coffee <laughs> and slept for maybe two hours, had to get up early fly home to Seattle. And so I emailed a bunch of people that I thought had more knowledge about this. And they said, well, it sounds like Kundalini rising. Look it up. I'm like, well, what does that mean? And I'd heard the word, but I had no idea what it meant. And, um, and then what happened after that was about every second or third night, I just would call it the energy would come. 
And it got to the point where I almost couldn't wait to go to bed. I took my kids <laughs> to bed and I never knew it was going to happen. And um, it, I had that same like orgasmic experience, incredible bliss experience. And, um, and then one night it just felt like all the doors were blown wide open. Like, I don't even know how to put it into words. It sounded like the ultimate drug trip, except I don't do drugs and I wasn't drinking either. Mm. So uh, yeah, I, I won't go into all the details, but it went on for months, if not years. And um, I, I came, I used to come home from work just before the kids would get off the school bus and sometimes take a little nap because the energy was so intense that it would wreck my sleep. Mm. But at the same time, I didn't really want to give it up. You know, it was sort of like, do you want sleep or do you want the drug? Oh, the drug you know? <laughs> And um, it was horrifying and scary sometimes. And in my case, a lot of the visions were endless goddesses. Mm. Uh, I had sex with so many beautiful goddesses, I can't even tell you. It was crazy <laughs> sexual energy, too. Um, lots of visions of serpents and big snakes and cobras. I would wake up in strange yoga positions. I didn't even do yoga. So. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, it went on and on. And... Um, and <clears throat> most of the time it was confined to my bedroom at night, but sometimes the energy would spill out. I'd be out in public and the energy would come rushing into my body and go flowing into somebody else. And I'm like, and I knew it was some sort of healing energy. Um, um, but that was, it was random. It was unpredictable. There was one, I wrote one chapter in my book. I took my daughter and two of her little friends out to a Chinese restaurant. We're just sitting there, you know, everybody's just chattering and I look off and there's a an Asian waitress and she's tall and kind of slope shouldered and not very attractive and my male judge was in full force and she goes through some swinging doors and when she comes out this incredible transformation she's like the most beautiful creature on the earth and I'm like I'm this grounded person I don't see things except at night in my bed like I can't even believe it like I can't believe it was like beauty incarnate and I and and it's over in like five seconds, and nobody else has seen it but me. <laughs> My girls are chattering away, and, <laughs> and uh, so um, it was one of the most fun, enthralling, exciting, sometimes harrowing, terrifying times of my whole life. Um, and it, I did read a lot of books on the subject, and I even conferred with some experts on the subject. And the funny thing is. Um, some people have come to the conclusion that kundalini energy is nothing more than just balancing energy. Mm -hmm. If you've been very one-sided, this energy creates balance. And I have been one-sided. All the things that normally you would attribute to being masculine qualities, I had in spades. Very linear, structured, rational, organized. I had a clean desk, you know, and 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 tended to talk rather than listen. You know, and and so. I think that period of time and that energy was bringing in the entire, what I'm just going to call loosely call feminine side. Mm. And so my grand conclusion after all that energy and all these crazy visions, I feel more whole today. Mm. I mean, it's not very grand and dramatic. That's how I pretty much end up the book. There's a nice balance between masculine and feminine. And I, I, I know one woman I talked to said, you know, she felt quite solid in her feminine and her journey was more masculine energy coming through. And so that's, she was the one that said, I really think it's balancing energy. So if you've been living one side, the energy is going to balance you. That is absolutely <clears throat> that's absolutely so extreme. <laughs> it's so fascinating. Like, you know, you must have been exhausted after all of that, like... Oh, it was unbelievable. Yeah, I was like, sometimes I had a love-hate relationship with it because I single dad running my own company was really struggling for a few years. I dog tired, come home and just, but it, luckily it didn't come for a night or two so I could catch up on sleep. So I think it knew just how far to push me. Mm. It's like, now nah, get some rest. We're going to, we're going to do some work tonight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible. So does it still happen for you? Not really. I still feel twinges in what I would call my perineum or root chakra area. And there's something there that's like a message. I don't even know how to put it. Like uh, I've heard other people talk about that too. The energy kind of fades and they call it their Kundalini talks to them. It's sort of like a, 
I'm not sure what it is. Uh, sometimes when I feel a really particular connection to somebody, I'll feel little twinges down there. Um, you know, um, I forget his name, Lawrence, uh, Lawrence Edwards, I think is his name, PhD. And he wrote like probably the last word on the subject. And he wrote a book early on, like 20 years ago, that I love because his journey was very similar to mine. And he said, really, the whole goal of Kundalini energy is union with the divine. And, but I think it begins with this sort of um, not being so one-sided mm. and be willing to, uh, you might call it embrace opposites. I mean, we live in the sort of world of duality and there's opposites in everything. There's being assertive, there's being passive, there's speaking and then there's listening, you know? Uh, and, and so that whole process that took a long period of time, I think was balancing out those opposites in me. Mm. And it's almost like you were a conduit for that energy, you know, to to see the world in a different way as well. Um, yeah, like absolutely. like you described, like and to spread that healing, you know. I think, um, wow, that is an incredible experience. Absolutely, <laughs> I've incredible. had a few people read the book. Go, how do I get that Kundalini? Energy? I know, right? <laughs> I don't know. There's tons of people practicing it and seeking it. Mm. Uh, and, you know, the, we, I think we all have a conscious mind and an unconscious mind. And, you know, I've heard some people say we're as little as maybe 1% conscious and 99% unconscious. And some people say, no, it's like 20, 80. I'm not sure. So, but my conscious mind was completely clueless. Mm. And it makes you wonder what triggers that, you know, like I was thinking, you know, there's a connection to joy there. You know, you, you've gone and you've done your TV bit and it, it went great. And all the other moments it flowed through were moments of joy and yeah. calm. And so it makes you wonder where the connection and the trigger is. But, oh, so fascinating. I could talk about it all day. <laughs> <laughs> I could too, believe me. I don't know what the trigger is. Um, I do have a sense, and Kundalini is not the only thing, that there is just sort of a what I would call a divine timing to things. Mm. You know, sometimes you push and push and push and nothing happens. And a year later, it happens. And so I've kind of had to learn, you know, find the balance between being assertive and will and pushing and just laying low. And it's just not my time yet. I, I don't know. I really don't know. And, you know, like there's so many people who are seeking that 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 awakening and um, the more you push, the less you're going to get it. So when we let go and let God, you know, um, that's yeah. when things truly happen and, and the you know, the divine takes control. Um, yeah. So, wow. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> now, John, if people want to find out more about you, where can they go? Uh, my website is John David Latta. My last name is spelled L-A-T-T-A, johndavidlatta.com. And uh, that'd probably be the best way to find me. Brilliant. Now, I got the last big question for you, John. What's the change you want to see in the world and how do we bring it to life? Um, you know what I love? When I went to my first spiritual retreat, I didn't have a lot of wild, crazy spiritual experiences. Those came years later. Um, but what I did discover was I enjoyed, kind of like we talked about earlier, connecting to people in a real authentic, vulnerable, honest way. That's the change I'd like to see in the world. People um, be fearless about sharing their honesty, their authenticity, and their vulnerability. Um, it's such a beautiful way to communicate with people. And like you said, I think it is permeating the workplace now. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's like, oh, bullshit. Come on, let's just speak. Let's just be real with each other. And that's the change I'd like to bring to the world. You know, some people, I, I get in certain situations, it's sort of appropriate, you have to do it, but it might be to the degree you can, uh, let's not wear masks anymore. Mm, that's exactly what I was I was getting uh, coming through as you were saying that, is like we wear masks. Like, yeah. um, and, you know, I had a situation this week where I don't normally do that anymore, but I found myself doing that and I went, and I stopped myself and I actually went back to my true authenticity and went, nah, you know what, this is what I'm really thinking and this is what I'm going to do. Instead of putting on the mask and letting people hear what they wanted to hear, I let the truth out. And I was like, that's it, you know, I'm not going to beat about the bush anymore. I'm just going to be truly me. Um, and I'm, And people are used to that from me. So I was a bit shocked that I'd put that mask back on. And I was like, no, yeah. no, nah, nah, we don't do that anymore. 
So oh, I, love that. I, I completely agree with you and I experienced that this week. So yeah, amen. Let's, uh, let's do more on that without the mask, um, <laughs> despite COVID. Um, <laughs> so, wow, John, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for being a part of the ethical evolution. I love that we got to talk to each other. I love that you're clear literally on the other side of the earth for me. And God only knows it's tomorrow there, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Coming to you from the future. <laughs> I love having us talk with you, Bindi, and I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Ethical Evolution Podcast. If you're ready to be the change and would love to work with me on finding your voice through spiritual coaching or creating your own podcast with impact, visit ethicalchangeagency.com. Hey, what's happening out there, everybody? This is Lawrence Ross, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about my podcast, The Lawrence Ross Show. Egomaniac. It's a two-hour weekly exploration into my mind. I also do sketches, celebrity impersonations. You're out of order! And I also do song parodies. Not too shabby for a blind guy. Not only are you visually impaired, but you are geographically impaired. New episodes are released every Friday. Check it out on your favorite podcasting platform or listen to it here on Society 13 on Electrocast. Welcome, explorers of the human experience. This is Let's Talk Soul, and I'm your host, Claudia Monticelli. We're not afraid of the great mysteries of existence here. Soul versus consciousness, we're on it. Spirituality versus science, we've got that covered too. Join us in navigating these profound topics with wisdom, curiosity, and a dash of audacity. Whether you're a spiritual veteran or just starting your journey, Let's Talk Soul is your passport to the unknown. Let's Talk Soul, diving into the depths of the human spirit. Subscribe now wherever you get your podcasts. Electric acid. Electric acid.